so this video concentrates on memory which is absolutely integral to learning we derive what we know from our experience so knowledge is formed based on our direct personal experience of the environment and in order for us to build up our sense of knowledge about the world we have to continue to compare new experiences with what we've experienced before we have to be able to recall past experiences in order for us to decide whether or not an experience that we're having is a new one and how much attention we're going to have to devote to it or whether or not an experience that we're having is something that we have experienced before in which case we don't have to put that much attention into it so the cognitive processes that are involved in paying attention and processing information and making sense of that information and learning and growing and developing cognitively all seem to rely on memory as a process and it's an incredibly complex process because our brains are incredibly complex organs what we're going to do today is try and break it down into the very basic processes which means that the explanations that are going to be offered here aren't complete explanations for how memory works but they are illustrations about how memory functioning might happen so on a very basic level when you talk about learning when you try and define learning you can say that it's the changes that happen in single neurons as a result of information from the environment the patterns of sense information that we are exposed to create changes in individual neurons the neuron picks up information from our sense receptors and conveys that information onto another neuron so there's a physiological change that happens in that nerve cell if we didn't pick up that sense information we wouldn't be learning anything about our environment so learning is change in the neuron at the most basic level what happens after that in order for us to process information in order for us to remember that information that single neuron has to connect to other neurons particularly when it comes to processing information in the brain we find that individual changes in single neurons lead to messages being conveyed to whole other networks or groups of neurons so we end up with single changes leading to changes in entire systems of neurons and we can talk about those changes in the whole system of neurons as memory particularly because systemic changes are relatively long lasting they last a little bit longer than individual changes in individual neurons which means there's a biological basis to the notion of memory traces the idea that once you've processed information it is somehow stored through the network of connections between neurons in our brains our brain cells remember the connections that they make we're going to look at conditioning uh just briefly because it's a very simple model of how learning happens and a, a a really good example to illustrate an idea like this it focuses on very basic behaviors um the pairing of a stimulus and a response and the learning of an association between information that we receive and the behavioral response to that information as well as the way in which we can compare different bits of information um in responding to them we're going to focus on classical conditioning in classical conditioning 
uh, if you remember Pavlov's conditioning experiments with dogs. What he did was he presented food to the dogs and then they started drooling. So he spoke about the food and the drooling as a natural pairing of a stimulus and response. The food is the unconditioned stimulus and drooling is an unconditioned response. It's a very straightforward association that's made between those two things. The animal sees food and physiologically drool comes out because they expect to digest it. And then what Pavlov did is that every time he presented food to the dogs, he rang a bell as well. So he paired the conditioned stimulus, the ringing of the bell, with the unconditioned stimulus, the food, put them together, and still conditioned the unconditioned response. The animal still salivated. Eventually, Pavlov removed the food, and the conditioned stimulus alone, the ringing of the bell, became enough for the animal to start drooling because the animal had made an association between the unconditioned and the conditioned stimulus. So this is a process by which we learn to make associations between things. And we do this on a very basic level when we're young. When our cognitive capacity isn't very strong, we learn through this kind of response. And when we get older and our functioning becomes a bit more complex, we still do learn by stimulus response, but we add a bunch more complex behavior on top of that. And you could even argue that thinking, internal cognition, is an internal process of stimulus response. Neurons are firing and other neurons are reacting. And they are reacting to the pairing of particular kinds of stimuli in different kinds of ways. So this classical conditioning model is quite useful for helping us figure out how neurons react to sense stimuli. And what we find when we look at learning is that intense stimuli and repetitive stimuli often lead to in intense and strong learning clear, lasting laying down of memory traces. So we do know that something must be happening in our brains biologically and physiologically when we are learning something. So one of the key things that we try to do as psychologists who are interested in brain function in the last century was to try and figure out exactly where it is in the brain that learning happens. And we've done it in all kinds of weird ways. The first is what is known as the search for the engram. The engram is an idea that was developed by Carl Lashley. And Lashley argued that when learning happens, we know that neurons are undergoing physical changes. So when we make an association with a stimulus and a behavioral response, something physical happens in the brain and that must have a location, that physical change. And surely if it's there, it can be found, it can be seen. And how we're going to see it is we're going to try and disrupt the brain functioning. So he argued that engrams would be physical traces, physical evidence of learning having occurred. And he argued that these engrams were very likely to be found in the parts of the brain that deal with higher level functioning, the cortex, the cerebral cortex, the brain matter. So what he did is he took a bunch of rats. Rats have contributed quite a bit to psychological sciences because the kinds of things that he was planning to do were not really okay to do on humans. That's usually the case. He took a bunch of rats and he gave them a task of running through a maze and seeing how they could learn to get through the maze, how well they learned the maze. And that relies on spatial reasoning 
and some kinds of memory. So once the rat had learned how to get through the maze, Lashley took it out of the maze, opened up its head, and cut the brain in a couple places. He would slice up the cerebral cortex in a couple different places to try and attempt to disrupt that learning. So he was basically saying, if I make a cut in a certain part of the brain, will that mean that the rat won't remember how to get through the maze anymore? You can kind of see in the in the picture all the different places where he uh, put incisions into the brain. And Lashley found nothing. No impact. He couldn't find the engram that he was looking for, the evidence of learning in the brain. He couldn't find it, but that didn't stop him. Instead, what he decided was that firstly, the cerebral cortex is very complicated and it functions according to a couple of principles. The first of those being equipotentiality. He says that all parts of the cerebral cortex contribute equally to learning because it's been difficult for him to identify any one part of the brain that has to do with learning of the cortex. The conclusion that he reaches is that learning is everywhere in the brain. When you do make a disruption in one place, other parts of the cortex are picking up that function. So learning happens all over the brain, well, the cerebral cortex specifically. And secondly, Lashley talks about mass action. He says that the cerebral cortex works as a coherent whole. It's not a case of different parts working independently to facilitate learning. The whole thing works together in an integrated way when we learn. So he couldn't find his engram, but he did figure out that the cerebral cortex, which is responsible for most of our higher mental functioning and learning seems to work coherently as a whole. And all the parts seem to contribute towards learning. So that's the first thing that we seem to know about brain function and learning. The second thing that we discovered um, in the results of, of research, again, using animal brains, is that the cerebellum is very important when it comes to making associations between sensory input and responses in the brain. So another researcher by the name of Richard Thompson decided not to look at the, the cerebral cortex He focused on the cerebellum. And again, because it's difficult to do this on humans ethically, he decided to do this on rabbits. So what Thompson did was an experiment involving the rabbits in which he had a little nozzle that pumped air, little puffs of air, into the rabbit's eye, causing an involuntary blinking. Unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response. He then paired the puff of air from the nozzle with the flashing of a red light. And then he took away the puff of air and every time the red light came on, the rabbit had been conditioned to blink. So basic conditioning task. The rabbit learned to associate the flashing red light with the puff of air in its eye and it responded. But then he wanted to monitor the changes in cells in the cerebellum. What Thompson noticed was that there's a particular area of cells in the cerebellum that seems to be quite active when the conditioning task is being learned. And he located this small group of cells in the cerebellum, which is known as the lateral interpositus nucleus. 
You can refer to it as the LIP for short. And Thompson noticed that this little nucleus is a small cluster of cells in the cerebellum. It was quite active and lots of changes happened in that bunch of cells during the learning task. So what Thompson tried to do was suppress the activities in that little group of cells. So what he did was he gave rabbits to the drugs or he made their brains very cold. And he noticed that when the brains were cold, the activity in that little nucleus of cells decreased. And when he did that, the rabbit didn't learn the associations as quickly between the puff and the red light. It wouldn't learn to associate that basic conditioning task. But when the drugs were off or when the brain warmed up, the learning resumed again at its normal rate. So he concluded that there must be something about that nucleus of cells that's really important for associating stimuli with each other. But we don't know that that's necessarily where learning takes place. So Thompson kind of thought, well, we know that there's another part of the brain called the red nucleus in the midbrain. It's another small group of cells which is responsible for receiving messages from the cerebellum and transmitting them to other parts of the brain, which means that the red nucleus is possibly responsible for the link in the chain of communication that allows us to formulate a response to a stimulus. So Thompson decided to, to do exactly the same thing but to suppress the activity in the red nucleus of the brain instead of the cerebellum. So he either gave drugs or made the midbrain cold. And he noticed that when activity had been suppressed in the red nucleus, learning seemed to stop. The rabbit couldn't make the association between the puff of air and the red light. But when the drugs wore off or when the brain warmed up, the association returned very quickly and very strongly. So this suggests that it's not the red nucleus which is responsible for learning. The red nucleus is responsible for transmitting that information to various areas of the brain so that it can formulate a response. But the learning itself seems to happen in the lateral interpositus nucleus in the cerebellum. So when the red nucleus was suppressed, it was a suppression of response rather than a suppression of learning. So the conclusion is that the LIP is really important for associative learning. And it's really important in retaining that associated information. So then we've learned things. And we remember things. The process of recalling that information is biologically related to another structure in the brain. The hippocampus. Clinical neuropsychological studies of people who suffer from amnesia, from brain injuries, suggests that the hippocampus and how the hippocampus works is really important for us in remembering things. So let's start off by saying that there's two types of amnesia. The first type is anterograde amnesia, which is the loss of memories that happened after any kind of brain trauma. Once we've injured our brain in a particular type of way, anterograde amnesia is then the loss of memory of things that come after that accident. This happened in the case of Henry Malaisen. Don't know if I'm saying his surname right, but he couldn't remember anything. He remembered his life before they took out his hippocampus, but nothing after. He woke up as an old man, still believing he was in his 20s. 
So you can remember quite effectively all the stuff that led up to that incident, but anything afterwards just does not get committed to memory. So anterograde amnesia seems to be related to short-term memory functioning. We'll talk a little bit about short-term memory in the next video. The other type of amnesia is when someone has head trauma and they don't remember who they are or they don't remember anything about their life before. This is referred to as retrograde amnesia. This is the loss of memories of things that happened before a trauma. There are no problems laying down new memory traces after an accident, but anything before we can't recall. And that seems to be a damage to the long-term memory store. So anterograde amnesia is the disruption of short term memory function and retrograde amnesia is the disruption of long-term memory function. The other thing we need to distinguish between is types of memory. There's declarative and there's procedural memory. Declarative memory is our memory for facts and knowledge and events. Things that we can talk about or declare when we are remembering. Whereas procedural memory is muscle memory, memory of like skills. It's not what you know, it's how to do things. And it's a lot harder to disrupt procedural memory than it is declarative memory. This is because it's related to behavioral kind of functions, which is diffused around the brain. It's not very easily uh, concentrated into the brain. So if there's any kind of trauma, it's diffused enough that it won't be affected that badly by any one particular trauma. Whereas declarative memory, uh, memory of facts, events, actual things, seems to be very highly linked to hippocampus function. Particularly when it comes to spatial memory or spatial reasoning tasks. This has been shown in some very interesting research that's been done using taxi drivers and rats. The studies that involved taxi drivers were used on London taxi drivers. And the experiment was quite interesting because they basically took a bunch of taxi drivers from London and put them in MRI machines and compared them against other normal people who weren't taxi drivers and asked them questions like, how do you get from this place to that place in London? Obviously, the taxi drivers will know the answers and they'll be able to describe the route quite well. Ordinary people obviously were a little bit less able to do that. But during the course of doing that remembering, the MRI machine shows which parts of the brain are active and the hippocampus lights up every time. And that memory task is about recalling procedures, but it's also about recalling what you know spatially in the city. And they found in the study that the taxi drivers had a, had a slightly larger hippocampus than everybody else, which suggests that the more you use that particular task of memory, the better that part of your brain becomes. When it came to rats, again, they did experiments with rats in mazes, and they gave them a little bit of brain damage. But the types of mazes that are used in these experiments are called water mazes. So what they do is they put a rat into a tub of water, like you can see in the picture. And in the tub of water, there's a little platform that's a little bit of submerged. So the rat can climb onto the platform if they find their way there. And the studies would take the rat and put it into the tub of water at a range of different points around the tub and see how quickly after the first time the rat would be able to figure out where it was supposed to go to get to the platform. So after the first time it found the platform, they took it out and put it back in at a different point 
and try to see if they if the rat could remember where the platform was and generally rats were quite good at this they figured out how to get it quite fast but when you damage the damage the hippocampus the rat's spatial reasoning went a bit haywire so in the image you can kind of see what happened when they did specific things to the rat when they damaged the hippocampus it really had no idea what was going on so you can see that with normal function they figured it out quite well quite effectively regardless of where they were put and in the middle is a graphical representation of what happened when there was damage to the neocortex and there wasn't so much difference but when there was damage to the hippocampus you get the last picture which is a representation of how the rats really battled to remember that spatial reasoning spatial reasoning and spatial memory seem to be really messed up by hippocampal damage so there's different forms of memory and they're affected in different kinds of ways. So how exactly do we lay down memory traces? What is the basis of our nerve functioning that allows us to remember things? So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about synaptic A synapse, as you'll remember, is the little gap between the axon terminal of one um, neuron and the dendrite of the other. It's the little point where they connect, kind of. And at that gap, electrical impulses are changed into chemical impulses. So what happens usually is that we get the picture that the first neuron transmits the impulse and the second neuron reacts by firing because of that impulse, let me say. So what happens if the first neuron sends the same message to the second neuron over and over again? The same message repetitively sent. What happens then is that we find that a Hebbian synapse develops. And that's named after the researcher who identified that phenomenon as occurring. What happens at a Hebbian synapse is with repetition of the message, the synapse itself becomes primed to receive the same message over and over again. So what happens is that neuron B, the postsynaptic neuron, starts expecting the same message to come from neuron A. So the postsynaptic neuron starts anticipating the message and one of two things can happen. First, if the same message comes through over and over again, the second neuron gets bored, you can say. It gets used to the message coming through and you can say that habituation has happened. It becomes habituated to that message and then it becomes less sensitive to that message. So a particular cocktail of neurotransmitters that's been sent through gets ignored. And there's a decrease in response due to repetitiveness. Another thing that could happen is that the same neuron becomes hypersensitive to messages that come over and over again. So it either kind of stops paying attention or it kind of realizes if you can say that of neurons that this is an important message and I need to pay more attention to that so what we see emerging is on the level of neural functioning we're filtering our attention there's a basic decision that's being made before we even start processing things our neurons are deciding for us either we're going to ignore this or we're going to pay attention. Okay, so what are the effects of this functioning of a synapse becoming primed? First, the priming state gets remembered. The neuron itself remembers the state of affairs that happened 
at that particular synapse. It remembers either habituation or desensitization in response to a particular stimulus. And we call this effect long-term potentiation. An analogy is lightning. If you think about the clouds as the neuron before the synapse and the ground as the neuron after the synapse, the gap between the clouds and the earth would then be the synapse. And the lightning bolt is the connection that's made between those two synapses, I mean, neurons. In order for a connection to be made efficiently or well, there must be an ionized pathway, a path of least resistance that the ions can follow. And then you get lightning. So this is basically the consequence of the Hebbian synapse. Long-term potentiation is the effect of changes in neurons as a result of how Hebbian synapses work. So a whole bunch of intense and rapid repetitions of a sense stimulus will leave synapses primed or potentiated, holding a lot of potential to send a message or the same message again really quickly. So what long-term potentiation means is that the synapse remembers the last mes message that it sent. And it holds on to that message. It becomes a memory then, basically, for quite a long period of time compared to how neurons work, which is just milliseconds. But long-term potentiation effects last effectively up to weeks. And if you think about the fact that neurons work, you know, less than a second, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a long time for a neuron. If the message is reinforced, it's just going to make the remembering a little bit more permanent. So during that process of potentiation, that synapse is way more responsive to similar input for quite a long period of time. So on a very basic level, neurons remember information that comes through them. We physically lay down memory traces. Each piece of information that we get from the environment triggers a particular set of neural connections. And that is remembered for a period of time by the brain. Those connections remain live. And because there's so many possible connections between neurons in the brain, it's possible for us almost infinitely to store bits of information through different networks or connections. So there's three properties to long-term potentiation that you should pay attention to. The first is specificity. Specificity refers to the idea that active neuron connections, connections between neurons that we actively maintain, that are triggered over and over again, will strengthen the potentiation effect. This means that we're more likely to remember that information. The second feature we should think about is the fact that neurons don't work alone. A single neuron in the brain connects to a whole bunch of other neurons. It doesn't just connect to one other neuron. So the more nerves that are involved in conveying information, the stronger the potentiation effect is. The more neurons work together, the longer the potentiation effect, which suggests that when we're trying to recall or remember information, the more attention that you pay, the more likely you are to be using more neurons, the more meaning that you process, the more likely you are to be using more neurons, the more likely you are to remember things. Depth of processing and focused attention aid memory. And the final property is called associativity. 
Nerve fibers are made up of a whole bunch of nerves clustered together. And strong impulses are spread out across the whole bundle. It is possible though for strong uh, stimulus and weak stimulus to be conveyed in the same bundle of neurons. The strong impulse will leave the synapses potentiated, but because the weak impulses sneak through as well, the synapse is also potentiated for the weaker stimulus. So when strong inputs are paired with weak inputs, there is likely to be an increased remembering or response to the weak input as well. And that's it for the first part of memory.